presence to come and then we'll get into the word. Father, we just come with thankful hearts and expectant hearts and hearts of love towards you. You are everything to us, Lord. We honor you and we worship you in all that we do. We ask you now to bless the reading, the preaching, the teaching of the word. Do do good stuff in us, Lord. We we get a little messy sometimes. Our lives get messy at times and we need you to come and and grace us and fill us afresh with your spirit. Touch this church with your mighty presence and just pray that no one leaves without being touched and changed, strengthened, encouraged, directed. We'll give you all the glory for every bit of it in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. All right, I want to look at the scripture we looked at last week. It was our key scripture. Let's start there. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. And uh, are we waiting for the screen to boot up as well, or what's... How about if I just read it to you while we're waiting for everything to boot up? 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace... So why don't you repeat it after me. The grace, the grace. Of, the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love, and love of, God of God and the fellowship... Of the, of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Be with you all. Now that's the benediction at the end of the book of Second Corinthians. But there's some very important things there. We see the triune God. We see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in that scripture, don't we? We see the love of God. We see the grace of Jesus. We think about his sacrifice for us and all that he gave us that we did not deserve. And then we look at the Holy Spirit, and what Paul writes about the Holy Spirit is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. What is fellowship? Anybody remember any of the stuff from last week? Or just, yes, Christina. Um, Yes, koinonia, intimacy, yes. Can you have fellowship without talking? Kind of hard, isn't it? We did a little demonstration. Who has an expressive face here today? Come on up, Kit. Kit's the man. Look at this guy. Let's give him a hand as he comes. Now, Kit, I want you to kind of look at, well, look at them. And I want you to just start telling them things, but don't, <laughs> don't say a word. Just tell them you're frustrated. Yeah, don't say a word. You've got to tell them with your faith. Tell them you're sad. Let's see sad. <laughs> Happy, <laughs> annoyed, <laughs> really annoyed is, is with your wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Is that good? So far, su- show them surprise. <laughs> Ashamed. Scared, <laughs> strong and courageous, strong like bull. There you go. All right. So, what do you think? Did you do a pretty good job? Yeah. Thank you, Kit. Would you like to take a bow and do an on? You know, you don't have to do an encore, but just take a bow and. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. You're the man. I think he did pretty good, right? But it would would, be hard-pressed to tell me what he was ashamed of or what he was scared of. You know what I'm saying? What he was annoyed with. Because he can't speak words. So, it's like that with the Holy Spirit. When the the Bible tells us about, talks about fellowship with the Holy Spirit, there's got to be some verbal communication involved. Now, when you talk, I know there are some people that talk a lot and they don't listen very well. That's a skill I encourage all of you to work on is your, your ability to listen and have a shared conversation with people where you're not doing all of the blabbing, you're inviting other people to talk as well, and you're listening to what they say, okay? Uh, good conversations are two-way. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I don't like to talk to people for very long that do all the talking. Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like you're doing this, and I want you to do this. All right, did you see that? You're doing this, and I want you to do this, at least for part of the conversation, 
so I can get a word in. Um, it's with, with the Holy Spirit. He likes to be listened to, and he likes to be talked to. And most of us really don't do a whole lot of either. Maybe it's because we haven't been schooled that it's okay to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I have sat under preachers that discourage us, you know, people in the congregation, from talking to the Holy Spirit. I remember one preacher said, you don't talk to the Holy Spirit, you talk to God through the Lord Jesus Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. And he kind of put it in a nice, neat little box. But it doesn't work that way because God is a person, correct? With a person, you can't predict what's going to happen next. There's just a, there's a sense of spontaneity. That's what makes relationships rich and fun. You know, if I, my goodness, if my wife greeted me the same way every day, hello, husband, your dinner is ready. Here is your kiss. Please be seated and I will serve you nourishing food and refreshments. And I mean, if it was the same every day, robotic, I would hate that, wouldn't you? That's not life. Life is spontaneity. Life, relationship is, you just real don't, the excitement of relationships is you don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, I have another scripture here. It's 2 Corinthians 13, 14, but it's in the message. Ah, and we're back. All right, go to the next scripture, please. It's in the MSG, the message. And it says, there we go, read it with me. The amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. That's what the Holy Spirit likes best. He likes intimate fellowship. He likes you to tell him your thoughts. People think of God like a slot machine. If I pray the right thing, I'll get what I want. You see, a lot of people treat God like Santa Claus. They treat him like, I don't know, a computer where you know good input, you get the right output. And again, we're dealing with a living being, the creator of the universe, but he has emotions, he has feelings, he has thoughts, he has moods, you see. And it's very, very important for you, very important, to begin to understand that God in that way, it will change your life dramatically, and it certainly did mine. I remember when I first began fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. All kind of things happen. Supernatural things, wonderful things. Doors began to open. The ministry, the anointing on the ministry just increased dramatically. I began to move more in word of knowledge and word of wisdom and healings and discerning of spirits and all the nine gifts of the spirit were manifest more in my life. Not just in church, but in everyday life. I want to go to a point here. Fellowshipping with the spirit always brings, first of all, brings unity and like-mindedness. Amen? Say that with me. It brings what? Unity, Unity and like. What does it mean to be like-minded? What? You think the same way. Does it mean you're a clone? Does it mean it's like a cult or something? No. Churches are not cults. God, we talked a couple weeks ago about God loving individuality. God loves unity, but diversity within that unity. Everyone being different. God's not into... Uh, being conformed unless you're being conformed to the image of his son but he does you know this is not a big brother kind of thing churches should never become like that fellowship with the spirit brings unity and like-mindedness look at the scripture in philippians 2 verse 1 and 2 therefore if there is any read with me if there is any encouragement in christ if there is any consolation of love if there is any fellowship of the spirit if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind maintaining the same love united in spirit and intent on purpose this is very important the holy spirit last week we talked about things that please the holy spirit unity makes him happy unity like-mindedness among his people makes him smile you could say the fellowship of the spirit it brings, when, when you're unified, it's easier to have compassion. You know why that is? Nobody's mad at anybody. When people are mad at other people, you can feel it in the atmosphere. You know what I mean? Have you ever just seen the, the mood of a room change when someone walked into it? 
And the less people that are there, the more impactful it is. I've been in meetings, in church meetings even, where everything's going great and then someone walked in with a mood. Walked in with a tood. A mood and a tood. I don't like either one, you know, unless it's a good mood. But you bring a bad mood that you can just feel the whole atmosphere, the whole dynamic of the, the meeting changes. Or if you're in your home, you know, you, you get home and your wife, your husband, somebody's in a bad mood and just, oh, and they're slamming things and you just, you feel that. And it, instead of bringing peace and harmony, it brings tension to your home. And we are called, husbands and wives, we're called to be li- living harmonious lives with each other. And sometimes that takes work, takes discipline. Having a good marriage, if, how many of you are married? It's hard work. Don't let anybody fool you. You, you quote, fall in love, and that lasts for about 10 seconds. Then somebody does something wrong, and the work begins. Isn't that right? Uh, we were on our honeymoon, and, you know, I was raised Italian, and my mom just, you know, served my dad. I mean, she domineered him in every other area, but for, like food, she just would, you know, make him sandwiches. And so I said, and we would brought some wedding cake with us. I said, honey... I would love a piece of wedding cake. And you know what she said? She looked at me like this. She looked at me up and down. I thought she was checking me out. No, she looks at me up and down and she says, Are your legs broke? I knew at that moment my life had changed dramatically. You understand what I'm saying. Uh, now, question for you. Anybody ever feel all messed up on the inside? Raise your hand if you've ever felt all... Oh, yeah, you're twisted into knots over something. Somebody said something to you. Really made you mad. Or something you had your plan, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men. You made plans and somebody got into the, these plans and screwed it all up. And now nothing was going to... You know, did you ever find out, Katie, that you, you plan things and life never turns out the way you, you expect it? There are twists, there are turns, there's just all kind of things, so many variables. And, but here's the thing, when you get into that situation, and it could be circumstances, it could be you get some bad news, it, you know, a lot of times it's still over people. Because people can be people, you know what I mean by that? People can be people. I wish I had some Twilight Zone theme music right now. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because people can be scary. And here's the thing. In any of these situations where you're twisted in knots, your stomach is tight, your shoulders are tight, you're, and you can't stop thinking about this bad thing, I have found that if you just bring it to the Holy Spirit and just start talking to him about it, Hallelujah. it starts to change. Sometimes slowly. Amen. But it starts to change. That thing that looks so, it's got you all twisted up. You start to feel your stomach start to untwist. You're talking it out with the greatest counselor ever. You know, the paraclete. He's the one that's called alongside you to help. That's what the Greek word means. And we looked at all the different uh, things that paraclete means. And one of them was counselor. He's your closest friend. He, what do counselors do? What? They give advice. They listen to you, but then they don't just listen. They give you advice. They give you direction. They throw options out at you. See, the Holy Spirit's the best counselor. And so when you, yeah, he's very wise. He's the source. Remember, he's, he is God. Ever say with the Holy Spirit is God just as much as the Father is God, just as much as the Son is is God. Dave's that good doctrine? Yeah. The three persons of the Godhead. They are three, yet they are a united one. Each has a different function. And the Holy Spirit has a certain function right now in the, this world and in our lives. One of those is counselor. So, now, when you talk to the Holy Spirit, you begin to fellowship with him about that thing that's got you all twisted up. Uh, let's be honest about it. We did foster care. We, did, we, had, we were a therapeutic foster care for seven years. Remember all that fun, honey? Oh, yeah. The police knew our name. 
They were at our house a number of times, depending on the kids and the problems they had. And so, we found that some of our teenagers that we had, they felt more comfortable in strife and contention. So when our home was at the most peaceful and harmonious, you could see them getting worked up. They'd start working themselves up about something because that's how they were raised in their particular home. Fighting, arguing, you know, and over nothing, over the littlest thing. It was like a, a ticking clock. You knew it was going to happen at some point, Danny, and, and there it was. Next thing you know, they're hollering, and we're just trying to, uh, what's the word, honey, when you, we read, you learn how to redirect them? Yeah. We had to learn how to, at one point, restrict them physically. Uh, I mean, it was quite a thing. And I, we learned a lot because we had to keep up 40 hours plus in education every year. So we learned a lot about the human psyche, what makes people do the things they do. I want to tell you, if you're somebody who needs strife regularly, you need to bring that to the cross over and over again. There's no other solution. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I can't give you a magic formula other than you have to know. And I, I know, you guys know me pretty well, most of you. And I'm not somebody who blows smoke at you. You know, I'm not going to give you some dipsy doodle teaching that if you are raised with, and with strife and you regularly want to bring strife into your home or your relationships, you've got to take that. You have to discipline yourself and take it to the cross. And say, God, I recognize this, but I take it to you. Holy Spirit, help me out. Show me why I'm doing this. And usually he'll tell you, well, because, you know, you and your mom fought all the time or whatever your thing was in your house. But if you do that, you will ruin your relationships, your marriage, and your relationships with your children, you see. It's very important. And so we take that to the Holy Ghost. And we talk to him. And he talks back to us. And my, you know, it's a little formula. It's very simple. Everybody say, strife, bad. Rest, good. That simple? So, yeah, when there's strife, you want to redirect yourself, the other person, if possible. Being also your chief counselor, the Holy Spirit, and as you talk it out with him, I have found this. He will start to, if you just fellowship with him, just relax Get yourself a cup of whatever you like to drink. Get in your easy chair and just start talking to him about this thing that's got you worried and all twist, twisted up, whatever it is. And here's what he will do. And I guarantee you, if you just keep fellowshipping with him, keep the discourse going, he will begin to unveil a plan to you. A plan to get you out of whatever you're in or a plan to fix whatever is wrong. A uh, plan to pull you out of the muck or the quicksand that you've gotten yourself into or someone else has gotten you into. And, or he'll help you. He'll show you that, you, you know, there are times when he's t told me, you need to just treat the, they're not going to change whoever those people are that don't like you. And you need to treat them, um, other than forgiving them, you treat them as though they don't, they never existed in your life. And you move forward. And you ask God to give you grace to do that. Perhaps someday they will repent or apologize or whatever, but if, they're, if, if you have strife that's attached to people, I can tell you sooner or later, if those people will not change, the Holy Spirit will say, you need to move on. They're not going to change. Stop going around this, what do you call it, when you put a rat or a mouse in a... Yeah, a wheel. The ham, stop going around this hamster wheel. What's, and, you know, he'll show you what's wrong with you in a nice way, that why you want this. Why are you keeping this relationship? What's wrong with you? You know, I just, honestly, I'm sorry. I'm not very pop culture psych, you know. I've said to my boys, let me just tell you how I talk to my boys. Do, she's laughing because she knows she lived with it. If you don't do this, I will kill you. Problem was solved. <laughs> Didn't need to see a shrink. You know what I'm saying? You do this again, you'll be dead. I'll slap your face right off of your head. <laughs> you'll be standing there like this. Because mm -mm -mm, your mouth, your eyeballs will be laying somewhere over this area. 
they knew me well enough to know I would do it. And so, you know what I'm saying? So there's really no other way than bringing these things to God, bringing your life before him in your ministry. And sometimes he will give you a hard word. Hey, what was that? Shame on you in that sound booth. I wasn't smiling like that when I said those things to my kids. <laughs> Amen? All right, the next uh, section, I just want to talk to you a little bit about grieving the Holy Spirit. You know the Holy Spirit can be grieved? Let's look at the scripture in Ephesians 4, 30 through 31. It says, read it with me, and do not, read it with me, grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him, by whom you were sealed and marked, branded as God's own, for the day of redemption, the final deliverance from the consequences of sin. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife. What was that last word? Say it one more time. Fault finding. Stop that. Again, nothing fancier. Just stop it. Stop it. Everybody has faults. Remember the, the microscope you put on other people is going to be turned on you. This is what the, I'm paraphrasing what the scripture says. The measuring stick that you use to measure and judge other people, that's the same stick that's going to be turned on you. I don't know about you, but I want a, a merciful stick turned on me. I don't want a stick that's going to beat me. I want a stick that's going to say, God's mercy, you know, grace, praise God. Let's read on. And slander be put away from you along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence. You know, there are people in this room, I know, I can sense it, that you, you do verbally abuse people that are close to you. I'm not going to point out who, but I, can, I know it. I can sense it. And it, how you act in church don't, don't matter. I've had nice, charming people. I've met them, and my little spidey sense started tingling. My Geiger counter which was going crazy. And I know that this nice, sweet, charming lady just tears her husband down. You can you just feel it around them. Or you got a husband who is just a, I don't know, he's a macho idiot. You know, he th he wins through domination, you know, through for humiliation, embarrassment. We're supposed to be kind to our wives, gentlemen. Kind. You can be firm and be kind. Ladies, you set the tone in your home. God holds you responsible. Set a good one. And even if your if your kids are gone, set a good one for you and your husband. Okay. Women have, a, women have a great power in regards to men. They can destroy their men, or they can build them up. And I've seen both. Haven't you? Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, let's move on. I think I've said enough about that. Are your toes hurting yet? I didn't come in here intending to step on anybody's toes. But... I mean, if I'm, it's happening, I deeply... No, I don't apologize at all. <laughs> Trying to help you. Can't always help people by just saying the politically correct nice thing. Amen? So, now, grieving... The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Grieving and hurting are two different things. The scripture doesn't say, doesn't say don't hurt the Holy Spirit. It says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, hurt, oh gosh, I mean, hurting can be, you know, I, I uh, twisted your finger, I said something mean to you, you know, and, uh, oh gosh, I, the word snowflake comes to mind, and I, it's probably overused, but we're raising in our society, listen, don't become a snowflake, all right? I mean, it's all about, oh, they said something mean. Who cares? People are going to say mean things to you. Get over it. Learn how to deal with it. Learn how to set boundaries. Because some of you, you have mean people saying stupid things to you, and you keep them in your life 
for some reason. Understand that that's unhealthy. And I want you to grow healthy. I want you to become healthy people in the Lord, you know. Healthy people are not doormats. They don't let themselves become doormats. Healthy people understand boundaries. You say, this, you can go this far, but no further, you know. I remember one time a guy threatened, he threatened to come back and shoot me. This is a long time ago. He didn't like what we were preaching or whatever. And uh, some of our deacons, he was kind of a loony too. And uh, that's, the, that's the clinical terminology for his... You know, Mike, you know what Looney Tune is, right? And every psychiatrist uses that term. <laughs> a couple of our deacons, a couple of boys took him out. Uh, not didn't, didn't kill him, they took him out of the church. <laughs> I saw some of your eyes. <laughs> what? Took him outside. And uh, one of these, one of my elders at the time, he was a former uh, swimmer. He's an athlete, he's a tall guy, handsome guy. He's an architect, and he, but he'd been a real big time swimmer in high school. And uh, this guy, this Looney Tune, popped him right in the nose, punched him. And he said to him, that's the only one you get. You do that again, I'll be over you, and then you'll be nothing. I'll destroy you. And the guy didn't touch him again. He knew. I mean, Scott was a, you know, Scott was a very intelligent guy, but he was a tough guy. And so, you, you know, but that's setting a boundary. Some of us, we get verbally popped in the nose all the time and we just take it. You know, the decisions you make as to who you will allow in your life and what you allow them to do with you or to you is going to determine the whole course of your future. It's also going to greatly affect how you feel about yourself. Amen. You know, God doesn't want a bunch of Christians running around with low self-esteem. He wants us to understand that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are his workmanship. I'm quoting scripture now. We are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, okay? We are valuable to God, okay? And so it's important that we have not only respect for other people, but self-respect as well. If you don't respect you, why do you expect anybody else to? Amen? The word grieving comes from the word lupa in the Greek, which means to feel mental, emotional, and even physical pain. I had a friend years ago, and uh, he just, there, there was, you could just tell there was problems, and so I got to talk to him a little bit. And he said, Mike, I have clinical depression. I was diagnosed with clinical depression. And I said, what is that? And I don't know if the terminology has changed. This was back in the uh, 90s, but he said, well, my psychiatrist told me that clinical depression can not only cause you mental and emotional pain it can actually cause you physical pain there are times I want to go to work and my body is racked with pain just from depression there's nothing wrong with me physically but I just feel pain all through my body I, did anybody know that, that did anybody know that I, I never knew that until he told me that how many of you knew that, that depression can cause physical pain and some of it may have been demonic in his case. You know? I mean, that's, demons can cause pain too. And they do exist, folks. And there are things that we can do or not do that, that allow them to have more sway, more authority in our lives. It's good to shut the door. It's good to be able to say what Jesus said. He said, the prince of this world cometh, but he has nothing in me. See? He could have said it, he has nothing on me as well. He has nothing on me. Okay. So if the devil has some, something or several things on you, it's going to allow demonic activity to come into your life and create havoc. That's why it's good. First of all, be in church. No matter what. Stop the crappy excuses. Nobody wants to hear them anymore. People do what they want to do. If you value what God says in his word, to forsake not the assembling, you find a way to do that. Just like you find a way to play softball or bowl or do the other things you want to do in your life. Well, you don't understand my job. Well, yeah, we all have had jobs. In the first place, I know some of you already take, I never took a job that took me out of church. And God always got me better jobs than with higher pay. Okay, number one. But I was taught that. You may not have been taught that. Secondly, if you're in a job that takes you out of church, you want my advice? 
You don't want my advice? All right, I'll just move on. Anybody want my advice? Start looking for one that won't take you out of church and pray. Put out resumes or make phone calls or I don't know. I don't know there's probably job search on computer now you can do, but start looking and pray and just say, God, I want a a job that doesn't take me out of church, but I need this much pay or more. And give him a chance to operate. If you don't put out feelers, it's not going to happen. Typically. What do you think? Somebody's going to knock. Ed McMahon's going to come knocking at your door. Big check. You've just won the Reader's Digest thing. Here's a giant check for a zillion dollars. No. You cast your bread upon the water. You pray. See, I could get. There's a whole. I have a whole message on productivity and, you know, the job market and so forth. But understand, people that were successful in God, people like Joseph. And Daniel, they were surrounded by heathen ideology, and yet they were the cream that rose to the top because they were people of prayer, they believed God, and then they were people of action. Put action to your prayers, right? Am I talking any good here? Is this any? Yeah. How many of you think this is good teaching here? Yeah. Because most of you live this. I'm trying to help the ones that aren't living this. Because your life is at a certain place right now, but you don't understand. Here's where your life is. It may be bad, it may be mediocre, it may be semi-good. But if you do some of the things that we're teaching, and we regularly teach her, your life can go from mediocre to great. Almost overnight. It's amazing. When people heed to these teachings, I've watched them get great jobs. Great jobs with future and potential. Better hours and more freedom. You see... People don't. People that don't want to listen, they just you know keep plugging away in the same old thing, and nothing changes. So you're you know mediocre again. The wheel. The, you know, what's the name of those wheels again? Hamster. hamster wheel. Yeah, you're in the hamster wheel. You're just hard as you can go. You're not getting anywhere. God wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. Trust me on that. He wants to bless you, really. Give him something to bless. And begin to give a little bit. How can you give to your church if you don't come? No. Start start with something. The widow's might. Give a quarter. Give a dollar. So, you know, and ask the Lord to at least get you to the level of tithing and bless you financially so that you can not only tithe, but have more than enough to, to give offerings to whoever you want. Yeah, you can send it to, you know, starving children. I don't know, you can do that Sarah McLaughlin commercial where they show these dogs. It makes me cry every time. They're all wounded and abused dogs. I can't even watch that commercial. How many of you are with me? You just, you just yeah, turn the channel until it's over. She sings the angel song. You're sitting there going, oh, man. Somebody really hurt that dog. I hate that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. This time of year especially, you see that commercial a lot. Um, all right, so the Holy Spirit can be grieved. He can also be quenched. This happens in churches pretty regularly. The quenching of the, it was happening today, at several points during the during praise and worship. And as a worship as a pastor and a worship leader, I can feel it. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. The Holy Spirit also can be vexed. What's vexed? I mean, anybody say to your wife or your husband, like, "You vex me." Anybody say that this week? No. But it's a... Oh, somebody said that? Who said that? Oh, okay. Kind of the same thing. Uh, Vexing is an interesting word. Uh, Isaiah 63.10. Read it with me. It says, But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. You don't want the Holy Spirit to be uh, your enemy. All right. Some translations uh, use this... uh, Hebrew word and they say they call it grieved here but in the original language the meaning is different from the New Testament word where it says don't grieve the Holy Spirit it means wearing down troubling and even afflicting someone another person you can't do this you can't wear down and trouble and afflict a force right it, this, this again reinforces the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person I can trouble you, Steve. I can afflict you. I can wear you down. But if you were just a, you know, 
a computer or something sitting there, I couldn't do that. Because there's no personalities, no emotions, you see. How do Christians wound and chase the Holy Spirit? How do they vex him? How do they quench him? Anybody? Hmm? Boy, that's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, the fault-finding thing. I just want to tell you, Holy, Holy Ghost doesn't like that. He doesn't like that. Anybody else? What's that? Running from, the spirit. Running from him. Yeah, that's kind of a form of rebellion, isn't it? There's overt rebellion, like, I don't like you. But then there's the rebellion that I'm going to ignore you. And again, you're dealing with God here. I had three words. I, one is ignorance. There are people that really have not been taught how to not grieve or how to not vex or how to not quench the Holy Spirit or how it can happen. Another other one is what we just talked about with Jason is rebellion. Third one is just insensitivity. Insensitivity, you're not paying attention. And that was kind of happening this morning at different points. Uh, Sean, Pastor Sean came up to receive the offering. And there were several people who had to go, shh. That's disrespectful. There's this loud hum, like half the people were talking to each other while one of our pastors is coming to receive the offering. And I don't know if you realize that the offering time is a form of worship. Just as much as the singing, isn't it, Pastor Lee? We worship God with our voices and our songs. We worship him with our finances. He gives us so much. And then all he asks for is to just give that portion. He asks for 10%. That's not much. You, get ten, you work, you get $10, you give God the first one. you still got nine. You know, if you think of it that way, see, people get all hung up on these things. Tith, you know, giving to God, tithing, that's Christianity 101. That's kindergarten. If you're still struggling with that, you haven't graduated from kindergarten yet. You're like Jethro Bodine on the Clampus. <laughs> oh, yeah. I used to say that with a... I had a couple... I had, I had three football... Out of my five boys, three of them were football players. Regularly, I would shake their heads and I'd do my best Jed Clampett imitation. I'd go, something wrong with that boy. <laughs> Remember that? I used to say it about Jethro. <sighs> <laughs> insensitivity that means you're not paying attention to what God is doing and what God is saying we have a precious short amount of time here together every week you know for I mean most of you make it every week some of you make it once a year or once a month or once every six months and you know I don't know what to say to you except I'm glad you're here but you'll really be helped if you commit the way that most of our folks commit really just say God I'm all in I'm all in if you're going to throw all in with somebody what's better than throwing in with God if you're going to sell out to somebody I mean people sell out to their boyfriend their girlfriend they sell out for their company their boss they sell out for a lot of things that are not eternal and, and but if you sell out for God you're investing in your future which eternity is just our this lifetime it's just nothing compared to eternity. The Bible says it's like a puff of smoke, okay? Anybody ever seen a puff of smoke? How long does it last? Seconds. And then it disappears. That's what the Bible says. This life is like a puff of smoke compared to eternity. It's like a bubble. I, when the weather was warm, I, was, I got bubbles, three bottles. Of, I was blowing bubbles with my granddaughters. You want those things to last. You feel real proud when you get one to last where you can, like, hold it and catch it or whatever but most of the time they pop you get a real big one oh please please last pop gone that's what this life is like compared to eternity if you're going to invest invest in eternity lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where moth and dust are not going to corrupt them that's what jesus that's the words of jesus so so many times in public services i've seen the holy spirit about to speak about to move and then I've seen, I've watched him pull back because he gets grieved by some fleshly manifestation, by somebody who's just either rebellious or they're not, they're ignorant or they're just insensitive. They're not paying attention. 
This is why the Apostle Paul wrote the following, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Read it with me. But if I am delayed, I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in, in the house of God, which is the church of the... Just in case you don't understand the importance of this, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, if there's any place you want to be respectful, it's here. I've been in churches where people constantly are moving about. I mean, really, you have to go to the bathroom three times during a sermon? Really? I mean, I just, it's amazing, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, if you, well, I don't want to say too much there, but really, we have that many people with bladder issues? Is that the, the situation, right? And another thing, why is it that women always go to the bathroom in twos and threes? No, that has, that's totally random. It's nothing to do with this. I just wondered that many times. Men don't do that. Oh, I want the bathroom to be nobody there when I go. All right, Danny? Don't want to go. No, Lee, I'm not going to go to the bathroom with you. You're not going to bathroom. I don't want you to go with me. That's a, it's not a, that's a girl thing, man. It is. All right, uh, let's move on to the last point. Results of fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. This is important. 1 Samuel 10, 6 and 7. Read it with me. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully. Is he just going to, is he going to come weakly or? No, he's going to come how? Powerfully on you. And you will prophesy with them. And you will be changed into a different person. How many of you since coming here, you've been changed into a different person? Yeah. Part, part of that is, you know why? Because we pray every service. You know, I'm doing on Saturday night, I'm praying. And you know what I'm praying? Come Holy Spirit. Last night, all, you know, hours to this morning, I said to him, I'll let you in on my prayer life this morning. I'm shaving and so forth. And I said, if you don't do this, uh, I can't. I need you to do what only you can do, Holy Spirit. I need you to be what only you can be. I'm weak. I don't have it. I can speak pretty good words. I'm fairly conversational. I need you to do what only you can do. I'll do my part. But if you don't do it, all that's going to happen is I'm going to give a nice talk. Did anybody come here just for a nice talk? No, you go to a social club and have a nice talk. You can pray, play bridge with the girls or have a guy's poker night and have some nice talk. It's so important to me that he anoints the things that are spoken here. It's so important to me. He, if I make a mistake, he covers it then. And I make mistakes once in a while. I made one in 1962 once. <laughs> now, verse 7. Read verse 7 with me. Once these signs are fulfilled, do what, what stop for a minute, do whatever your hand finds to do for God is with you. God is, let me tell you how important it is. When you go down this path, when I'm, you commit yourself to God, you sell out, you commit yourself to the body of Christ, you hear the word preached every single week, it affects you, it permeates you. You add to that that you begin to have this conversational tone with the Holy Spirit. You're talking to him all the time. And if, you, if you, that wanes, you come back here because this is the best, the church is the greatest support group ever created. It was God's idea. And the, the support you get here, I've heard so many people say, oh my gosh, I was on vacation, I missed two Sundays, I gotta get back, can't stand it. Well, they're addicted. But that's a good thing. Even in Corinthians, Paul wrote about Steph, uh, Stephanus and Achaeus, how great it was that they were addicted to the ministry of the saints. It's an obsession, but it's a magnificent obsession. It's one that's going to lead you to heaven at the end of it all, you see. You can get obsessed with all this other garbage, and it's gone. 
When you die, it's gone. Just being real with you. All the things you're all consumed with, when you die, it's gone. And you can go at any minute. My best friend, I got a call a few years ago. My best friend, he was a young guy. He's healthy, never had any prior issues. He was a truck driver. He was in a, a, a restroom at a truck stop. And he just dropped and he was gone. Gone. You never know. And let me tell you, when that moment comes, you're going to wish that you'd invested in the kingdom of God instead of all the other excuses that you invested in. If you don't have that, you know, here, David encouraged himself in the Lord. There's nothing wrong with saying, God, and being honest, God, I don't have much heart for you right now. I don't feel like I have the kind of heart that Pastor talked about this morning, but I want it. Could you give it to me, please? Could you please give me a heart that's on fire for you? Could you give me a desire? And it's just, let's be honest with him. God knows anyway. You're not fooling him. What do you think you're going to put these secret thoughts in some lead-lined box? You know, because Superman's x-ray vision can't see through it. God, you know, no, God knows. You may as well just admit it. Just turn to somebody, just turn to somebody next and say, you may as well just admit. Admit it. Because God knows anyway. That's uncomfortable, isn't it? Like only like one third of you actually did that right now. It's like I don't think I want to say that. <laughs> Some of you are like I don't think I want to hear that. What if the person looks at me and they're prophetic and they see it in my life? Oh no, I got to get out of here. Right? <laughs> First time we had past Leon Price, who was the greatest prophet I've known. He was my mentor. We had him co come and. We didn't know him, but we knew he read the mail. Boy, he could look at people and just boom, boom. You remember Danny? He just read the mail. Knew what was going on in your life. My poor wife, she'd never, we'd never had a prophet. She's like, I got to clean the house. I got to clean under the refrigerator. <laughs> She's afraid he's going to prophesy and say, there's dirt under that refrigerator. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. I got some good news for you here to close this message and that number one you are not hopeless I don't care what you think you are not hopeless no matter what's going on consistent fellowship with the Holy Spirit mixed with, mixed with a heart of obedience you combine that with regular reading of the word of God you hear the word of God preach regularly you're in church that changes you into a different person Amy you're a different person than when I met 20 years ago aren't you completely changed I know some of you I could I don't have to read the mail I know some of your history because I'm your pastor you're completely different your life is in a totally different place than it would have been if you had just ignored God amen? amen fellowship with the Holy Spirit does another amazing thing for you it brings God's favor favor what is favor? Huh? What? Blessing. Like, what if God looked at you and, and said, of all my kids on the planet Earth, you're my favorite? You are. No, he said you were number two to me, but that's okay. But you can believe that. He also said, Dan, he told me once, Danny can believe he's number one. It's okay. It, it does no good for me to tell him the sad truth. That, <laughs> that well, the word favor is kind of, well, you know, favorite comes from favor. It's as if every one of us was God's favorite. That's how he treats us. But the ones that are successful in life are the ones who realize that. They believe it. They understand it. They grasp that God's favor is there for them. It's there for the taking. What if I had the winning lottery ticket sitting up here on the pulpit? I said, first one in the pulpit gets $10 million lottery ticket. Some of you guys would be elbowing each other in the mouth, tripping. I could see it now. Esteban, Christina would be running up here. Esteban would tackle her. <laughs> Abby would step, step on Esteban's back to get to the pulpit. <laughs> Just get a flying leap to get the ticket. 
I can see it in my spirit. <laughs> it brings, when you talk to the Holy Spirit, it brings God's favor to bear. Think about this from a human standpoint. Business people understand that when you go and present yourself personally to someone, they're going to be more inclined to make the deal. Face to face. That's how it works. Every business is still a people business in spite of the computer age. There's got to be a first contact where someone li you know, likes you. I can just say it from experience. Walt, you were there too, and Dave. Remember, we had a we had a carpet business. Dave and I did, and Walt worked with us. We had suppliers. We had a number of suppliers. We had a showroom. We purchased carpeting and vinyl, eventually countertops, tile. We did all kind of stuff, and. You know, we had a number of different suppliers that supplied the things we wanted. We ordered them, they sent the stuff. But if a guy came and talked to us and we liked him, you know what would happen? We had two such guys. We would steer the customers towards their product because all the products are pretty much the same. They all have their good points or bad points. We'd find the best product, but with the guy we liked. What's happening? He had our favor. And we had two uh, $100,000 accounts who loved us. We went to the show, Walt, remember? They wined us and dined us. Oh, we had great steaks. We had, and then we got to see the market, all the new products once a year. It was favor. When you talk with the Holy Spirit, there's a love thing, a love connection that happens. It's not like the TV show. It's a real love connection. And favor, success starts to come to you. It's amazing. That's why it says in that scripture, read it again, it says, what's, you know, first the Holy Spirit came upon Saul. He was changing a different person. And then he said to him, do whatever your hand finds to do. Whatever. Whatever. For God is with you. Gosh, I remember early days of this church, we started it. We had some people that came with us, or that, you know, we, and there were some unhealthy people that were mixed in emotionally unhealthy. I was in a meeting one time with some prospective leaders and uh, one guy, particularly unhealthy, got all upset about something. I don't even remember what it was and he got so mad he threw his Bible on the floor. Just threw it right on the floor and he's just kind of making a scene. I don't know if you remember that, Walt. And, uh, the, you know, the whole mood, everything was, this mood changed in the room. It was, and it's very tough to deal with. This is the beginnings of this church. We're just going through some rocky moments there. And a brother came to me afterwards and he said this. He said, Mike, I know that guy was like coming against you. You might feel bad about it. But when that was happening right in the middle, I saw a vision. I've never seen a vision before. Jesus was standing behind you. Not sitting in a chair. You were all sitting in a chair. Jesus was standing behind you and he had his hands on your shoulders. You know what that means. That's God saying, I'm with him. See, when you walk into any situation, you want God to say, I'm with her. I'm with him. That's my person. Right? And then things just start to unfold. And you start having an unusual amount of success. And sometimes you succeed. You, honestly, I'm being really straight. With you. Sometimes you succeed. And Cindy, you understand what I'm saying. You'll succeed in plans that you thought were kind of stupid to begin with. Like, I'm just going to kick the tires on this thing and do something ridiculous. And you're pretty sure it's about 90% doomed to fail. And then the thing happens. You get success. I was sitting with a pastor once. I didn't even know the guy. I'd met him once, and I invited him over, and I'm sitting in my office with him, and the Holy Spirit starts bugging me. He pesters you sometimes when you have when you're with you know when you have a relationship with them, and he's like nudging me, saying, "Ask him if he wants to merge with you. He wants to merge his church with yours." I've never sat in a room with this guy before. I thought it was the stupidest thing I ever heard, to be honest with you. So I'm talking to this pastor, and the Holy Spirit saying, "Ask him," and I'm like, "That's ridiculous." What do you want to just embarrass me? He's just going to laugh in my face or, you know. And he just kept bugging. It was so annoying. Some of you are thinking, can you really talk about God like that? I'm just telling you. He, there's, when you have a relationship, 
these things happen. Absolutely. Is there anybody here who has a relationship with someone else? You tell me they never annoy you? <laughs> We're going to have an altar call for big fat liars. <laughs> and so he was just really annoying me. It was like a pesky, like, finally, just to get him off my back, I'm, I'm going to suffer the embarrassment. What would you think if I said that maybe we should merge our churches? And he looks at me. You have to understand, ours was the larger church, so it was understood that he was going to have to give up his role as the chief leader in his church. He's going to be in his, that was understood. So that's what made the question all the more difficult. And uh, he looks at me, almost like he was prepared for it, and he goes, "Yeah, yeah." Do you know how rare that is for a pastor to even consider merging? Most pastors are control. I'm just going to be honest with you. Most pastors I know are control freaks. No. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of pastors out there. They should not be pastors. They should be associates or deacons or something. Because their churches are, you know, if you have a church, I know like one, one brother used to go here and he was, he was my youth pastor one time. He's got a church, he's got, after 10, 12 years, there's 10 people. And they're very unstable people. I mean, is that really a successful thing? Is that something that really, uh, to me, I don't think that should exist. But there are a lot of people that they want to do what I'm doing. Or they see these TV preachers and the success and all the crowds and the, what they perceive as glory... And they, will, they want a following, even if it's three people. I, there was one guy came to our church. He, was, he had a three, uh, two kids and an older gentleman living with him, who, who he later stole from, took advantage of the old guy. He said, I'm the apostle, my wife's the prophet, and the old guy Dave is the evangelist, and the two kids are the pastor and the teacher. And that was his church. He was the apostle. And it was five, four, four family, you know, I mean, I've heard so many ridi you know, ridiculous things. There are preachers who just love the sound of their own voice. There are preachers who just want a following. They're not in it for the sheep. They don't care. I've been under preachers like that, that I was just a means to an end. That's why I'm so careful. Like, when our, you know, we had a staff meeting last night, and, uh, you know, Bill, that's why I was like, I don't want to presume that the worship team is going to do more than, you know, because I know you guys work. Most of you work. You have jobs. You work hard. I'm very careful about I'm careful not to. I want to care for people, not use them. You understand that there's a different way of thinking there. And I've seen, I've been used by pastors who didn't care one thing about me, my marriage, my children, nothing. They just, whatever you give, they want more. You know what I'm talking about, Christina? No matter what you give of yourself, your time, your money, they want more. And they don't, they don't minister to you. They don't care. They'll call themselves your pastor, your apostle, whatever. They don't care about you. They are psychopaths. Or what's the word I'm looking for, Cindy? They are sociopathic. That means they have no ability to really feel what other people feel. It's all about them. Everything revolves around their world. And so we don't want to be like that. But I want to tell you that if you will begin this wonderful adventure with the Holy Spirit, He will open doors for you of success. Amen. I, man, we started this church. We had nothing. A friend of mine, another pastor, says, Mike, you need to go talk to the, the Baptist church over there in Wesleyan in Barberton. Why? They're like, like, there's 15 people. They want to close the church down. They don't know what to do with it. Okay. I went over physically and met the pastor. He liked me. Imagine that. He said, you've got to come to our staff meeting. Now, this was a Baptist church. Has anybody figured out we are not a Baptist church? <laughs> yeah. They sang hymns. They had very <laughs> traditional, you know. Nobody was filled with the Spirit. Nobody had their prayer language. It was just a really straight lace. But they had shrunk and shrunk. It's a lovely building, and 
I went. <clears throat> they asked questions. I shared what my vision, my heart was for the city. I went home. They had another meeting next week, and I get a call around 1 o'clock, 1.30 from that pastor. You know what he says? He says, are you sitting down? I said, yeah, why? They really like you. You talk because you talk to them. You talked on, on their level. And you shared your heart, honest and open. So basically, we want you to have this church. We want, I forget what they wanted for. It's like $75,000. It was worth $350,000. Three, three acres. Lovely little building. Sweet. And the only reason they wanted that is they had several Baptist missions that they wanted to give the money to. I'm like... That's less than our rent payment where we are. Our mortgage would be less and we would own this thing. Just walked right into that. Bang. That became the foundation that later we sold that and got our next building. Okay. And then our third building was the same way. I got word of mouth. It's actually Mike Brillhart was renting the place. You know Mike. And, and uh, they wanted to move down to Manchester Road. And he told, told him about this thing. Uh, we just and they just the same thing. It was a Church of Christ. They wanted eighty four thousand dollars for missions. That's it. Well, then that building. You, some of you know the story. We had a fire. The building burnt down. This building that we paid eight hundred or eighty four thousand dollars for. Is it all right if I talk about this? Is you, I want to show you what. Because the whole time, my whole life was conversing with the Holy Spirit. That brings the favor of God. We had a fire. Now, nobody, we're not pyromaniacs, nobody here set the fire. What happened was, again, I was in my office, by myself, Mike, just me and the Holy Ghost, and my little dog, Mowgli, who was with me at the time. I'm going through some message notes, uh, some old messages, and I found this building layout for a church building. And the, the building we're in, I didn't really like it. It was it had a lot of steps, and it was hard to get around. And you know, it was a good location. It was on this road, and I said, "Am I going to ever get to build this building?" Just talking to the Holy Ghost. Am I going to get to build this? Two weeks later, massive fire, burnt to the ground. We had full replacement coverage. They wrote me a check. You're all ready, okay? This is favor. They wrote me a check for $650,000, insurance company, for a building we paid $84,000 for. That's pretty good equity, isn't it? We're only there for, what, a year or two, Lee? I mean, it wasn't very long we were there. We did pretty good over a couple of years. Anybody else here would like to make $600,000 over a two-year period? Would you be happy with that? And that was what enabled us to build this. And there's a home on it and the church. And I live in the home with my wife. And, and then we just bought this two acres back behind us. There's another home on that. Mark and Pammy live on, in there. There's a, a swimming pool, a deck. And we got a heater so we can do baptisms anytime. I could do baptisms next week if it was 20 degrees. Just get some warm robes, you know what I'm saying? And just hey, make a quick run into the house. But when you're in that water, it's going to be 90, whatever, however much we want it to be. It's amazing. We added parking. I mean, praise God. God's favor is amazing. But also it's, it comes, his favor comes in ministry. When you talk to him, he talks back to you. And then when ministerial things come. Man, I could, you know, I was buying him own business in my office. And I was going through some visitor cards. We were doing a little outreach. And I got to one card. And the Holy Spirit says, I want you to go visit this guy. It was a, a woman said, my husband is bedridden. He is, uh, what do you call when you don't leave your house? He is, what? No, no, he was sick. He's an older man. And he's a, bed, what? Shut in, thank you. He was a shut in. She wasn't. She's an older lady. She said, my husband is a shut in. I wonder if you would pray for him. And I, I had hundreds of cards who were doing outreach. But the Holy Ghost says, go to him now go to him now when I got there I found out there was a whole lot more she'd been praying for him for years and years and he was a Methodist and the church he grew up in said they taught him about God's wrath but not about God's love nothing about God's mercy or his forgiveness okay I got to talk to him about the love of God for the, he had never heard that then with tears he and his wife knelt by his side 
This older man, his name was George, he received Christ. He had never known Jesus all the years in the Methodist church, never knew him. He thought he'd done too many bad things that God could not love him, could not forgive him. He got saved gloriously right there. And then six months later, and we used to bring tapes and videos from our, you know, she'd bring them home with her and he'd watch them. We'd visit him. And then six months later, I did his funeral, his home going. He went to be with Jesus. And she was a regular part of our church. All kind of exciting things like that can happen. One time the Holy Ghost said, go see this guy. His son had said, this guy was the worst father ever. He's an alcoholic. He had the, the, all the boys, we all ran the streets in Portage Lakes. Every time I mention God, he curses God. Now he's sick. And, the, this, and it was an elder of mine. It was one of his boys. He said, you'll never reach him. You can visit him if you want to, but I can tell you, he's just going to yell at you, spit on you, and tell you to get out. He doesn't want anything to do with God. And I walk, I got there, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't get to him right away for some reason. And then finally the day came, and he said, now, now's the time. So he was in the hospital. I went, and it was, you're going to think this is weird. All right, look at me and say, I promise to try not to think you're weird. <laughs> Super, when you talk to the Holy Spirit, supernatural things happen to you. I got to his room and I tried to walk in. I couldn't go in. So one time I said, Holy Spirit, go before me. The presence of God was so thick. It was like running into a force field. I couldn't get in the room. So I thought, you know, I'm kind of ornery. So I took a few steps back. I figured I'll get a run and start here. <laughs> Bounce off of it. You know, I said, God, God, are you gonna let me in this room or not? And it was like the Holy Spirit was having fun, probably watching me just, oh, you know, like, oh, look, he's gonna hit his head again, you know? Come here, angels, check this guy out. It was like a YouTube video, heavenly YouTube video went viral, probably, you know? I'm like, look at this weirdo trying to get into this room. And then finally, the third time I got in, and the presence of God was so thick, and this guy's man, his name was Lloyd. He opened his eyes, this mean, nasty guy, been cursing God all of his life. And uh, I said, hi, Lloyd, I'm Pastor Mike. And it was like some of the recent services. I said, he's like, and I said, you're ready to receive Jesus, aren't you? A little tear rolls down his cheek. And he says, yeah. Received Christ that day. Very sick with cancer. He, he died a few months later, and we did his funeral. We were able to tell his whole family that even at the end of his life, he gave his heart to Christ. Those are the, you live a supernatural life, and all you just, you're doing is you're just having fun with the Holy Spirit. Just talking to Him, and His favor comes upon you. And whatever you set your hand to, this, people get so, they, such consternation. Am I going to do the right thing? What do I do? This or that? You know, what if I zig when I'm supposed to zag? And I never think like that. I never think like that. Do you know why? Yeah, I talked to the Holy Spirit, and I, and I know that whatever I set my hand to, he's going to cause it to prosper. If I make mistakes, he redirects me in process. I don't worry about zigging versus zagging. Listen, God loves you too much to make you all you know, lose sleep over whether you should have uh, teetered instead of tottering. You know what I'm saying? Forget about all that. That'll drive you crazy. Just talk to him. Just, and then just do what you think he's saying to do the best you can and watch him open doors for you. It's not hard. It's easy. Jesus said that um, my yoke is what? Easy. easy and my burden is? Light. He's not going to overburden you. We're too dumb anyway. We're like just, little, just dumb little sheep. We just need, oh, God, I'm too stupid to really deal with all this. Can you just make this happen for me? <laughs> and then I walk in and everybody just falls all over themselves to give me what I want. That's true. I'm just telling you the truth. It's amazing, okay? All right. All right. God is good, isn't he? Amen. So, uh, Erica, how you doing, sweetie? Yeah. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Is he? You sure? When did you meet him, sweetie? Really? She just got saved in this? Congratulations. 
I'm so happy for you. That's wonderful. Well, we want to give you something, if that's okay. It's a little brochure. I wrote it, so it's really, really great. Okay. It says what? Can somebody grab the brochure, please? It says that now that I'm a Christian, what do I do? It could say everything you want to know about being a Christian, but we're afraid to ask. Um, but it's really good. It, and if you read that, it's full of scripture. and it'll, It's not long, but it puts you right on the right course. Because we want you to succeed, okay? You come back next week, right? It's important. Got to have that fellowship. Amen. Don't, don't let anybody tell you it's okay to just miss church. This will bless you. This will help you. Did you get blessed today at all? Be in here? Yeah, I did too. I like as much as you. I think I might even go here if I wasn't pastoring this church. <laughs> well, all right, so. Some of you, because of last week, you actually took the message seriously and you've been talking more to the, God, to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I don't know who that is, but I was told last night I'm supposed to bless those of you that have been doing that since last week because you're finding that it's rich and it's good. If that's you, come forward and I'm supposed to speak a blessing over you. I took it seriously, Pastor Mike. I've been talking more to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. I took it seriously. That's why God uses you. That's why God used you to lead someone to Christ today. You know? Let me tell you, folks, I was like him. When I was a young Christian, I was like him. My pastor said it, I went and did it. It's crazy. I mean, if it was in the Word and he said it, I did it. I put it into, I implemented it into my life. And it changed my life. I had a great marriage, a great family, wonderful children, things that many people would envy. It'll happen for you. Now, those of you that are not coming forward, I would hope if I give this word next week that you'd be up here because that tells me that uh, you didn't really take seriously. Like, you don't want to just come to church and hear just the like words and then go home and be the same person. No, no, no. The Bible says we go from glory to glory. To glory, to it's an endless thing. To the next level of glory, okay? God wants you to move to better, higher levels in Him. I want to bless you right now. Just close your eyes for a moment. Put your hand on your heart. And say, Lord, I receive. In Jesus' name, now I speak blessing over these people. I thank you, God, that they're increasing and enhancing their relationship with you at every level. Now, Lord, I call your favor. I call your favor into being in their personal lives. Let your favor now begin to take control of their pathways, their decisions. I, th I pray, Lord, they don't worry about zigging or zagging or any of that. They just keep on this course. Because I know that you bless them and I bless them. I bless their efforts. I bless they're drawing near to you. I know what your word says. If you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Open doors for them. Everywhere their feet trod, I pray you give them that. Every one thing they set their hand to, I pray that it turns to gold. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. All right. Is everybody here filled with the Holy Spirit? How's your prayer language? If you don't, uh, raise your hand, come on up here, and you'll get it. Anybody here that wants their prayer language or they need to be filled with the Spirit? Who's put in applic? Somebody's put in applications somewhere, and there's one or two. Who is that? Is it you? And who else? Is there somebody back here too? If you put an application or applications, and you're you're just trusting God to open doors for you. I want to pray for you. Praise the Lord. Is that you, darling? Oh, praise the Lord. Really? From where? Warren, good for you. We're happy that you're here. I'm going to get to you in a second then. And that's you. Who else? There's somebody else too that you, you've been looking for a better job or a new job. And Is that you? What are you waiting for? 
What are you waiting for? Come on up here. Where's Bernie at? He's what? Oh, he wasn't feeling good today. She wasn't. Okay. Sure, we'll include Bernie. Who wants to stand? You want to stand in for Bernie? All right, come on up here. All right, very good. All right, I need some ministry team up here, please. Hands on Terry and Chuck and what's your name, darling? Nancy, that's right. Alright, I just I thank you, God, for your favor. Now keep talking to the Lord. Keep talking to him. Amen. Learn to, to have conversations with the Holy Spirit. What you're you're not doing this to get a new job, but good things will everything will blossom out of that. Good things will happen. Trust me on this. So, Father, as they just converse with you, Spirit of the living God, I ask you to open doors for them, including Bernie. Open doors for them that no man can shut. I'm asking you to prosper and bless them with jobs, good jobs, good hours, good pay, and jobs that they can enjoy and learn from and advance in their lives as well as their financial careers. Yeah, and the Lord says to you, uh, when the door is open, walk boldly through them. Don't walk gingerly. You know what I mean? There's a difference. Walk with confidence through those doors. God wants you to understand that he's, He is with you. He's going before you. His favor is upon you. Amen. Do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Praise the Lord. I just bless them in Jesus' name. All right, does anybody else want to be filled with the Holy Spirit today? Do you know about it? Do you know what it's about? Okay. Have you ever been prayed for before to receive the Holy Spirit? All right, come closer here, Dylan. Just bring, come right over here, right here. Yeah. All right, very good. And I need some of you around to just lay hands on her. All right, so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for increased power in your life. Power to be a witness for him be a servant for God. It's something that happens after salvation. It's something where the Holy Spirit fills you, comes upon you, changes your life. There'll be a greater measure of joy, greater measure of peace. He also wants you to have a prayer language. You know what that is? Okay. In order for that to happen, it needs to be understood that you must do the speaking, that he will give you the utterance. The Bible says that they spoke as the Spirit gave utterance. That means you're going to hear some sounds and syllables, but it's important for you to be brave, be courageous, and speak them out. And don't be embarrassed all alone, because everybody around you is going to be doing this within a few moments as well. We've all crossed, how many of you all crossed this path and you have your prayer language, you're filled with the Holy Ghost? Yeah. How many think it's wonderful? Say amen. It is wonderful. Jesus is right here because he's the one who baptizes you in the Spirit. He's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Okay. Right, so I'm going to pray a prayer and then when I'm, and I'm going to ask you to repeat after me in English. And then when we're done, I want you to not speak English. No matter what. Okay. But I want you to speak one of those sounds and syllables that will be coming up through your spirit and your mind. And, and be brave and speak them out and then he will kind of take over. He, his job is to give the utterance, and it's our job to speak. All right, let's pray. Say, Heavenly Father. Nice and loud so I can hear you. Heavenly Father, I come before you, and I'm a Christian. I need more. I need to be filled. I need to be baptized in your spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in my life and in my heart. I want this more than anything. So I receive now your fullness. Fill me. I love you. I want to serve you. I receive now the full baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Just close your eyes, don't focus.
good, isn't he, folks? Amen. God just gave her just a clear, beautiful, heavenly language. It's lovely. Praise the Lord. So good. Yeah, you just stay there as long as you want to, sweetheart. There's no hurry at all. Danny, you had a word for someone? The microphone, you want to use one of the mics up here? Here, why don't you use this one, Sean? What's your name, darling? Erica. Erica? Can you guys hear me? I can't hear. Okay, Erica had, had an amazing service today. Erica was delivered from a demonic attachment in the other room. Erica received Jesus Christ in the other room, and Erica got filled with the Holy Spirit today, right in front of your eyes. Praise God. Wow. And God's truly amazing. When God comes Amen. in, he just takes over. Amen. The enemy was thrown out in the street. Yeah. She was brought into the kingdom of God yeah. and filled with the power of God. Yeah. It doesn't get any easier than that. That's right. I have to prophesy over Luke. Yeah. Up here, Luke. God's got something to talk to you about. Of course, he had to tell me first before you found out. Like God. Relax. Come up here, buddy. Here Turn to face crap. Luke, when I looked over at you this morning, the Lord started to speak to me about who you are in the kingdom and what he wants you to do. And then he started to talk to me about, he said, Luke, my son, the reason that it's not worked out, he said, because I've called you to the ministry. I've called you to be a missionary. I've called you to go to the four corners of the world in a business suit. He said, son, the reason that it didn't come together is because when you were young, I laid that upon your heart. I, I, that's why you have a desire to travel. He said, I put that desire in your heart. That's why it wouldn't come together. That's why you couldn't work it out. He said, son, you've come back into my house, and in my house, things are done decently and in order. He said, you've come back in, and you've said, Lord, I surrender all. And the Lord says, I came in, and I surrendered all on that cross so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. He said, I laid yeah. down my life just as you laid down your life. He yeah. said, son, I've set the steps of the building process in front of you. He said, I've laid a foundation that no other man can lay. And he said, that was my son, Jesus Christ. He said, now you are in the church. You're in process. And he said, things in process in my house require patience. He said, let me work out with you your own salvation. I want you to work it out, Luke, with fear and trem trembling, self-distrust, looking away from everything else that would distract and continue to look unto my son, Jesus Christ. He said, son, I've got you by your hand now, even as I... Danny's got you by your hand. He said, I've given you the ability now to hear the sound of my voice. He said, don't try to put this together yourself. Don't try to figure it out yourself. He said, many are the plans and purposes of your heart, Luke, but it's my purpose for your life that's going to prevail. He said, from a young man, you knew me. As a young man, you embraced me. He said, things in your life fell apart, but I put them back together. And he said, when I lay a foundation, it cannot be moved. He said, from here on out, it's going to take time. It's going to take process. He said, plant yourself in my house. And he said, in due season, you should come in and you should go out and you shall find green pasture. I, I'm called in faith to rise up in you right, right now like the, the water that comes over the sandy beaches of the ocean. I'm causing faith to rise up. He said, put your hands up. Speak in your heavenly language. Dole, roque, le coltre, dote. He said, look day by day, hour by hour. He said, I'm doing something in your life. He said, don't try to do it yourself. He said, look to me. 
Look to me, my son. Look to me. I've called you. I've ordained it. It'll happen. Take your time, but take me by the hand of us as I've taken you by the hand, declares the Holy Spirit. He said, and in due season, you shall have your own family and you shall speak to them even as your father spoke to you in your youth with love and kindness and tenderness. He said, in due season, these things shall come to pass. He said, but right now it's time for me to lay that foundation in you of concrete and steel because you are the tree of righteousness. You've been planted in the house and he said, you shall grow up and there shall be many little trees Lord. come around you in due season, declares the Holy Ghost. Mm. Amen. 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 Thank you, Danny. Uh, someone in here, maybe more than one, uh, had an injury. And they told you it was going to heal up, but it never healed up right. Never healed, and you're still having trouble with that area that was injured. Is that you? Why don't you come up here, sweetie? Is there anybody else, too? Yeah, what was the area in your... What? Really? Really? What, what happened? Did you sprain it? Okay. Okay. All right. We're going to just watch God heal this right now. Who else has an injury? Was that you or are you just too pregnant? Somebody else too. You have an injury and it's never healed right and it bothers you. Come on up here, darling. Can you come? And what's your name? Pam. Praise the Lord, Pam. And are you, are you related to the young Megan's mom? Okay. It's nice to see you. And you know Jesus, right? You know him as your Savior. What is, what's your injury that didn't? I have leg injuries from knees from my back being hurt. Okay. And recently I fell over and injured my wrist. I have injured. tendons that are tore in my wrist right now. Yeah, okay. Uh, as I still need prayer, but I did get kind of a praise report. Yeah. Um, because it's through workman's comp, I need they have to give me therapy. Okay. I've five days of therapy, and I've already gotten 20% of okay. back in my wrist. Okay, that's good. Oh, this is that's my dominant great. hand. So, yeah. But he wants me to be back to 65% like I got in this one. Amen. Praise the Lord. But I've had previous injuries with my legs and all my right. knees, and I'm diabetic, and I'm still dealing with all that. So. Okay. All right, well, let's watch what God does here. So what's the worst thing? <coughs> it's, uh, it was injured. I was, well, it was my wrist. Your wrist, okay. All right, Christina, you want to put your hand on her? Just, I don't know, grab her wrist or do whatever you feel led to do. But Glory to God. All right, everybody, just if you would, just pray quietly in the spirit. Maybe stretch your hands up this way. Just want to just ask that the power of God be manifested up here in the altar. Let it come. Let it come, Holy Spirit. Let it come. Let it come. That's your um your left foot, right? Is it your left foot? All right, in Jesus' name right now, I curse any infection in Amy's foot. Command it to leave her body right now in the name of Jesus. I speak life and health to her foot, to her leg, and really the rest of her body from head to toe. But right now we just focus on that area and I just pray that healing virtue. Lord, remember we remember the woman with the issue of blood and how you said virtue has gone out from me when she touched you. And Amy's here to touch you, to receive healing from you. And so we focus our minds and our hearts and our prayers on her left foot. And we say, foot, be healed in the name of Jesus. No more pain. No more torment for our sister. In Jesus' name. And Christina, could you put your hand on her wrist there? And <coughs> yeah. In the name of Jesus Christ, we speak life and health to that wrist and healing. God, I thank you that even now virtue is being released to Pam. For that area and for the rest, we speak to her blood sugar. We speak to her knee and her back. Every area, Lord, and we just ask that you would just 
Wow. Do a complete overhaul. She just needs a complete overhaul, Lord Jesus. We believe you to do it. Because you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I thank you for healing our sister. We call her healed in the name of Christ. Everybody says, Amen, Amen, Amen. 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 Wow. God is good. God is so good, isn't he? Lily, how you doing, sweetie? What's, uh, how's your daughter? What's going on with her? Yeah, the one that was here. Oh, okay. Well, good church? Well, I'm glad she's in church. Praise the Lord. That's good. Amen. You doing okay? You need prayer for anything? Everything. <laughs> All right, why don't you stand up right there in the aisle. I want a few of our ministry team to go over and speak a prophetic word over her. You guys... Don't all jump up at once. Ministry class. Speak the word of the Lord over her. Mike, how you doing? How, what about this Mike back here? How are you doing? Are you feeling better, Mike, up here? Mike Kozak? Yeah. We heard you had a little bit of a bow. Everything okay? Oh, that's all? Gee, she had you dead and buried. I mean, <laughs> No. I'm glad. That's good, man. I'm glad. I was kidding about that. I don't want to start a fight here. That's good. I'm glad. Christian, how's your? How are you doing, Christian? Any more chest pain? Yeah. Oh, that can cause that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we just pray right now, God, to just um, we pray over his stress factor. Help him to process things in a way that's healthy. So he doesn't have that anxiety that can cause the adrenaline, the chest pain. We come against that in the name of Jesus. We speak peace to his soul, to his spirit. Amen. In Jesus' name. And Sammy Joe, how are you doing? Yeah. Good. I'm glad. It's good to see you back in church. You were at movie night. You go, girl proud of you. That's the way to do it. That's the way to get off to a good start. I'm very proud of you. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. What's up? Regina.
Right. This position of your life, I'm, you're going to begin to acquire knowledge. He said, well, as you age and as you go forward, I will add wisdom. Wisdom says, Praise the Lord. Amen. Did you have something or just praising God? Okay. All right. Good. Sean, anything? You want to say anything? No? All right. Amen. I think we're done. Oh, I do want to mention this. Uh, we're having a membership dinner in January. And if you've never, if you haven't become a member of the church, there's a sign up. It's on the table, right? Did Jenny, you and Sue, did you guys get the clipboards and do any of that yet? Yeah, because we were going to do that, remember? But yeah, we want you to come if you're new here. It's just basically a fun evening. We give you a great meal. We, you, you can ask questions. You can ask me, your members of our staff, anything you want. Almost anything. And uh, we'll answer your questions. You find out more about the church. And uh, then you can decide at the end of that if you'd like to become a member. Like, how many of you are members of this church right now? Yeah. So you can be one of, you know, just like these people. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> and then uh, the week after, if you're in, for those of you that are newly saved, we are going to start a uh, new believers uh, class that's going to last eight weeks, and that will really help you establish your foundations in God. So we're excited about all of that. There will be a discipleship class in the spring. If For those of you that really want to just suffer abuse at the hands of Pastor Mike, it's really a, no, it's a, it's a spiritual boot camp. And... Uh, it's really, God's used that time to build a lot of strong men and women in, in the faith. A lot of leaders have come out of that class. So, all right, love you all. Amen. Don't forget, what are we doing next week after church? What more can be said after that? Yeah, bring a dish, anything you want to cook something good. It's your favorite dish, bring it. We're going to have a lot of fun. Prizes, good prizes will be given away. Yeah, we may even have a raffle. Yeah. All right, God bless you guys. We love you. Have a great week. We'll see you movie night this Wednesday.